Hello all. I hope you're doing well. This is the first recorded service of hopefully many to come. This month we're focusing on the theme of covenant. I'm going to start with some opening words by Reverend J. Abernathy Jr. We affirm that love is our greatest purpose. Accepting one another is the truest form of faithful living. The search for truth is our constant star. We pledge our hearts, minds, and hands to challenge injustice with courage, to find hope in times of fear, and to live out our Unitarian Universalist values every day as a beloved community. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all that is sacred in life. I am going to light the chalice in front of me. If you have a chalice or a candle at home that you would like to light as well, please join me. Reverently, we covenant together, beginning with ourselves as we are, to share the strength of integrity and the heritage of the spirit in the unending quest for wisdom and for love. I'm now going to share a story called Stone Soup. This story is told in many countries and languages. In France, Hungary, and Russia, the travelers are soldiers returning home. In Eastern Europe, an axe is used instead of a stone. In Scandinavian countries, a nail replaces the stone. In a Native American version, a bear provides the stone. Many years ago, three monks had been on a pilgrimage to the Deprung Monastery, which is located outside of Lhasa, at the foot of Mount Gafal. It was the largest and most beautiful monastery in Tibet, along with two other monasteries called Ganden and Sara. Together they were known as the Great Three. Drepung was most famous because it had once been home to the Dalai Lamas. It was huge, with over 7,000 monks living and working there. The three monks had been overwhelmed with the majesty of the monastery, and now, on their way back to their small and modest monastery in the mountains, they talked about all the things they had seen. While they had been given food for their trip home, it had not lasted as long as they had hoped. It was mid-morning on the fourth day of their return when they came to a small village. The villagers had seen them walking up the road. They ran into their houses and shut the doors. They had no intention of sharing what little food they had with the monks. As was their custom, the monks took out their begging bowls and approached the first hut they came to. The oldest monk knocked on the door. When a middle-aged couple opened the door, he asked, we are quite hungry and still have a long journey ahead of us. Would it be possible for you to give us some cooked barley? The woman said, we're sorry, but the harvest was so bad that we have none left, even for ourselves. The three monks went to the next home. The youngest monk knocked on the door. An old woman answered the door. The monk asked, could you spare a few carrots so we can continue on our journey? The old woman explained that her carrots had spoiled and she had to throw them out. They visited five more homes, but the response was the same. No barley and no vegetables. The middle-aged monk told his companions that they needed to take a different approach. All three began gathering firewood at the end of the village. Then they started a fire. A curious villager left his house to ask what they were doing. The middle-aged monk said, we are hungry and everyone in the village is hungry. We are trying to make some stone soup, but we need a big pot and water so that we can feed everyone. The man left and came back in a few minutes with a large pot. A number of other villagers brought water jugs to fill the pot. As the water began to boil, the old monk took a large stone out of a bag and dropped it into the water. He said, 
While it will take a while, you will love stone soup, although it is much better with carrots. A villager ran back to her house and returned with an arm full of carrots. He then added, and cabbage, and cabbages were brought by another villager, and so it continued, potatoes, yes, turnips, yes, onions, yes, celery, yes. Finally, the old monk said, the soup is almost ready, but if we add barley, it would be fit for the emperor. The oldest villager got two bags of barley and dumped them into the soup. Finally, the soup was done. Everyone agreed that it was delicious, the best that they ever had. For years afterward, the villagers told the story of how the monks made a delicious soup using just a stone. The sermon I'm going to share with you now was written by UU Minister Reverend Kirk Lodeman Copeland. It is titled, To Begin Again in Love. I don't know what grade I was in when I first heard the story of Stone Soup, perhaps third. What I do remember, which at the time caused me to think that I was quite clever, was realizing almost immediately what the three soldiers were up to. They began with stones, but they knew that human curiosity would result in a soup fit for a king or queen. Recently, however, I've come to realize that stone soup is less a story about an ingenious soup recipe and more about how we live in community. Barry Oshry, a pioneer in understanding organizations as systems, writes, We are story-making machines. We have stories explaining everything from the mystery of life to why the boss never responded to our memo. If we realized that we were making up stories, there'd be some fun to the process and little damage. The problem comes when we believe that our stories are truth and we then act on the basis of that truth. This is the same conclusion that Jonathan Haidt reaches in his book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. He concludes that we react emotionally and then make up reasons after the fact to justify our emotional response. We do this to make sense of our experience, to make meaning. The stories that emerge through this process of rationalism are often suspect, though they appear to be clothed in reason, because they only represent part of the truth. Haidt concludes, anyone who values truth should stop worshiping reason. This admonition is especially challenging to Unitarian Universalists because we place so much value on the use of reason. Haidt goes on to say that the limits of reason are pronounced and profound at the level of the individual, but the process of collective reasoning in a group tempers, transforms, and redeems the limits of an individual's reasoning. The villagers made up stories about who the soldiers were and then quickly acted on that truth. Soldiers are always hungry, they told each other, and quickly hid all their food. In place of hospitality, they pleaded poverty. The poverty was real, but it was spiritual rather than material. Because they were so prone to forsake strangers is there little doubt that they would also forsake each other in a time of need? It would happen as they made up stories about other villagers. Those stories, suggests Oshry, would paint others as being malicious, insensitive, or incompetent. This vicious cycle would then gain momentum as others reacted by getting mad, getting even, or withdrawing. Community suggests Peter Block, is a conversation with each other, not stories made up about each other. When we make up stories about others, we end up with pseudo-community, which M. Scott Peck said is characterized by partial truths, partial self-disclosure, and by withholding feelings. 
It is only in conversation that we begin to realize that our stories about others are more fiction than truth. It is only in conversation that we are forced to revise our stories as we encounter the other person's story about herself or himself. It is only in conversation that our hard eyes of judgment are transformed into the soft eyes of respect. That happens, writes Peck, as the masks of our composure drop and we see the suffering and courage and brokenness and deeper dignity underneath. Community cannot be built with triangles in which we talk about someone to others. Community can only be constructed with the clean, straight lines of direct conversations. Living in community is difficult. By way of example, Parker Palmer writes, community is that place where the person you least want to be with is. And when that person leaves, someone else arises to take his or her place. What Palmer doesn't say is that person is often the one who has the most to teach us. What Palmer doesn't say is that the issue is often not the other person, but our reaction to that person. By choosing engagement, the other person becomes a mirror in which we see ourselves and not a foil for our own projections. Creating community generally and creating a beloved community specifically takes skill, perseverance, sacrifice, wisdom, and a willingness to adapt to changing circumstances, and love most of all. Our Unitarian Universalist churches are not organized around a creed of right belief. Rather, they're organized around a covenant of right relationships. The covenants, whether implicit and unarticulated or explicit and recited weekly in worship, consist of relational values like love, compassion, loyalty, service, and justice. It is, however, not enough to have a covenant. Faithfully living the covenant is essential, as the Sufi mystic Rumi asserted. He wrote, if you are here unfaithfully with us, you're causing terrible damage. If you've opened your loving to divine love, you're helping people you don't know and have never seen. In Unitarian Universalist congregations, love is the foundation of our covenant, of our promises with each other and with the world. Keeping the covenant, however, is easier said than done. As Jewish theologian Martin Buber observed, human beings are the promise-making, promise-keeping, promise-breaking, and promise-renewing creatures. Reverend John Burens, a former president of the Unitarian Universalist Association said, a minister is a walking broken promise because there's always more to do than can ever possibly be done. The truth is, that his description applies to us all, minister and layperson alike, especially when we are bound together in community. Because this is true individually and collectively, we should always be willing to begin again in love. But love is not enough. We must begin the conversation again and again. Each of our stories contains pieces of the truth like small, brightly colored, irregularly shaped tiles. In conversation, we begin to construct a design out of those tiles, a mosaic of truth, which is never complete, never wholly accurate. Initially, the design is abstract and there are no discernible patterns. But as we all add our tiles of truth, patterns form, images emerge, and we begin to glimpse a larger truth. The ongoing conversation and creation of a shared truth both challenges and honors all of our individual stories and makes it possible 
for us to engage each other with a deeper love. Love is the spirit of this church and its ongoing careful tending is our most important work. The words I'm going to use while extinguishing the chalice are by Reverend Amy Zucker Morganson. I'm now going to extinguish the chalice in front of me. If you also have a flame in front of you, you can blow it out as well. When we take fire from our chalice, it does not become less, it becomes more. And so we extinguish our chalice, but we take its light and warmth with us, multiplying their power by all of our lives and sharing it with the world. Our closing words today are by Reverend Krista Taves. It is our work shared with each other in covenant that creates and sustains this beloved community. We've extinguished the chalice, but its light lives on in the directions we have chosen today. The light of this faith lives on in us, together in our hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits. Amen and blessed be. I hope you have a great rest of your week. I've included a PDF that has First Unitarian Society of Pueblo's Covenant included, as well as more readings on the topic of covenant, should you wish to read them. <music>